All right, good afternoon. Welcome. We'll let people uh, continue to stream in, but let's get started. Got it. All right. Welcome to the University of Chicago McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics 43rd Interdisciplinary uh, Annual Interdisciplinary Lecture Series. The title of this year's uh, series is Advocacy in Healthcare and Medicine. And today we are delighted to have Professor Anna Itlis from Wake Forest University as our speaker. Before I introduce Professor Itlis, I want to remind you that next week, our very own Professor Lori Zoloff, and when I say our very own, not only from University of Chicago, but our McLean Center faculty will be speaking. Um, you can find the full schedule for the entire series on the McLean Center's website, which is going uh, undergoing updates but we need your help in advertising the series. We want more people to come. We want to disseminate this widely. So if you have a network of people that you can share this with, direct them to the McLean Center website. They can get on a list host. Um, they can get notified of events, not only for the uh, noon lecture series, but for the annual conference and other things. So we appreciate you all coming and we're looking forward to seeing you next week. But first, an outstanding talk today by Professor Itlis. So Professor Itlis is the Carlson Professor of University Studies professor of philosophy and director of the Center for Bioethics, Health, and Society at Wake Forest University. She holds an appointment in social sciences and health policy at Wake Forest School of Medicine. She's a non-resident fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, is a fellow of the Hastings Center and a past president of the American Society of Bioethics for Bioethics and Humanity. Professor Itlis' scholarly focus is primarily on the ethical conduct of human research, first in human studies, mental health, organ transplantation, and risk in research decision-making. She also works on ethics and policy issues regarding emerging biotechnologies. She is the founding co-editor of Narrative Inquiry and Bioethics from Johns Hopkins University Press, associate editor of the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, and co-editor of the Annals of Bioethics series. She earned her PhD in philosophy at Rice University in Houston, Texas. We are delighted to have you today. So please, everyone, let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for having me. I'm really delighted to be here and looking forward to um, the afternoon. Had a lovely morning meeting with people and um, looking forward to spending time with you and, and hearing from you at the end of this as well. Um, thanks so much for the encouragement to think about advocacy. Um, this was um, when I first sort of started thinking about this and preparing for today, two um, kinds of advocacy came to mind immediately. Um, one was, um, oh, I forgot I'm supposed to do my, I have nothing to disclose. Um, uh, I, two things that came to mind right away. Um, one was advocating for individual patients, um, and the other was sort of advocating for public policy change. I think those are two things that people often will think of when we when they think about advocacy. So I've heard the distinction between cases and causes used um, to distinguish those two categories, which I thought was nice language. Um, but as I read more and I talked to my colleagues more, I developed a really long list of advocacy domains and targets um, and tactics. and. Um, that professionals might use in various sorts of ways in their advocacy efforts. And so suddenly the topic became extremely broad. Healthcare professionals might advocate in a whole range of domains or contexts, such as public policy, institutional policy, the clinical setting. Public policy might be at a very local level, might be at a global level, might be somewhere in between. Um, advocacy might target individual patients. It might target patient populations. It might target um, surrogate decision makers, you know, as a way of advocating for patients, um, and and so on. And then there's a whole range of tactics that advocacy might take. Um, advocating for individual patients to secure insurance coverage might mean making phone calls or sending emails to appeal denials. Um, it might involve showing up on the evening news. Um, it might appear on showing up on social media. It might involve calling legislatures. It might in legislators. It might involve lying or deceiving um, third party payers, a topic that has gotten a lot of attention over time. Advocating for an individual patient to be listed for organ transplantation might involve um, powerful persuasion and careful framing of information or even withholding of information during a transplant team meeting. Um, advocating to secure operating room time, an inpatient bed in a psychiatry unit or priority for transplantation might involve exaggerating the urgency of a case um, in all different kinds of ways. 
Um, advocacy might involve trying to get a patient into a study or trying to get a patient access to an experimental intervention outside of the context of a clinical trial. Um, it might include framing information in a way that's aimed at getting a patient or a surrogate decision maker to make one particular kind of decision over another. So think about the NICU, uh, where there are parents who are trying to really say, we're not gonna treat this child because of a particular disability the child has, and the physicians and nurses involved think, this child could be treated and could have a reasonable life and they think the parents are wrong um, or the opposite, right? The parents are insisting on overly aggressive treatment in the from the perspective of the nurses and clinicians given what they think is, is realistic for a child. Um, it might involve the outpatient pediatric setting of trying to get parents to accept routine childhood vaccinations um, and so on and so on. It might involve talking with adult children to try to get them to make a different set of decisions for um, their parents. Healthcare professionals might advocate for particular populations. I can think of um, or the early days of HIV AIDS where physicians were sometimes involved in advocating at the local school board level to allow children with HIV and AIDS to attend school. Um, it involves, I would say, advocating for particular populations, doing things like removing race from the EGFR, something that was very popular, you know, a kind of hot topic of discussion over the last few years, and looking at other medical algorithms that um, perhaps inappropriately use and rely on race. Um, it might include advocating for health policy reform to protect children's health insurance programs or other sort of programs that people think are important for accessing health care. Um, it might involve reporting a colleague that you believe is harmful to patients and doing things that are wrong. Um, some health professionals have gone on strike to demand better staffing in the name of patient safety um, or to defend their own interests, such as pay. Um, we've not, not seen that so much in the U.S. Um, at the level of physicians, but in some countries we have. Um, or we might think about people who focus on specific research questions almost as a form of advocacy. Um, for example, I work with a number of psychiatrists who, um, whose research often leads to conclusions that are used to advocate for increased access to um, mental health care for persons who are involved in the justice system. Um, so our research at times might even be a form of advocacy. Um, and I also wanna call attention to advocating for medical students. So I'm thinking here particularly of the work of your um, neighbor down the road at Loyola, Mark Koscheski, um, who with a lot of his colleagues has done a lot of work to advocate for um, medical students or would-be medical students who were brought to the United States as children um, and are undocumented. Health professionals might advocate for um, improved public health in general by testifying before policymakers about infectious disease, pregnancy, tobacco use, all kinds of other things, trauma and seatbelt use, whatever, helmet laws. Um, they can promote change at the local level, advising school boards. I think a lot of physicians found themselves doing that um, during the pandemic, um, where they're either their children's schools or local school boards were drawing on local professionals to try to make decisions. Um, advocacy might involve um, advancing practice recommendations, new practice recommendations that change guidelines. Um, it might involve uh, lobbying for various kinds of policies at, at the population health level. Um, and I think you'll probably have other examples in mind and I will look forward to hearing those. Um, the point is that there's a whole range of domains or contexts as well as targets and tactics um, to consider in examining health professionals and advocacy. And with that wide landscape in front of me, um, I then was left asking a number of questions. Um, first of all, like what even counts as advocacy? Like, are some of these things that I've listed as possible forms of advocacy even advocacy? Like, is reporting misbehaving colleagues a form of advocacy, um, or is it not? Is it something else? Um, is educating public policymakers advocacy, or is it just education, um, or something else? Under what circumstances may healthcare professionals um, engage in various forms of advocacy? Um, when ought they to advocate? Um, that is when, if ever, do they have an obligation to do so? Under what circumstances should they not be involved in advocacy? Are there tactics that they might or might not um, use that are permissible or impermissible? And different people, to be sure, have answered these questions really differently. There's actually quite a broad literature on this. Um, so as I started to tease apart these questions, I was reminded of discussions in the philosophy literature that sparked my interest in public philosophy a number of years ago. So I wanna share that story because it'll help frame what I'm gonna talk about today. As you all know, um, in addition to physicians, people like philosophers and lawyers and, and scholars in religion and history and other fields were really involved in kind of the early days of what I would call contemporary bioethics, things like the Belmont Commission. Um, so Tom Beecham, was, who's a philosopher, was um, kind of the staff philosopher um, for the National Commission during the 1970s. And he um, wrote sort of a narrative of his um, recollections and his experience. And he said this, 
On my first morning in the office, Yesley, who was the staff director for the commission, told me that he was assigning me to the task of writing the Belmont paper. I asked Yesley what that task was. He pointed out that the National Commission had been charged by Congress to investigate the ethics of research and to explore basic ethical principles. Uh, members of the staff were hard at work on topics in research ethics, he reported, but no one was working on basic principles. He said that the opening round of discussions of the principles had been held at the Belmont retreat. The National Commission had delineated a rough schema of three basic principles, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. I asked Yesley what those moral notions meant to the commissioners, to which he responded that he had no well-formed idea and that it was simply my job to figure out what the commissioners meant or more likely to figure out what they should have meant. So I think it's fair to say that the Belmont Report and as the paper came to be known has been a quite influential um, document in, in sort of contemporary US um, bioethics in general and research ethics in particular. The idea that a philosopher had basically reverse engineered some ethical, an ethical framework from a series of conclusions and that that framework has had a lasting impact on research regulation and oversight led me to be really interested in the role of philosophers in public life. So I decided to teach a course on public philosophy a few years ago because um, in the academic world, that is the equivalent of see one, do one, teach one, right? If you wanna learn about something, why don't I teach it? Um, so it was in preparing for that course that I stumbled across a paper by Dan Brock um, that set me to really be thinking about philosophers and advocacy in the context of public policy. Um, he wrote this piece called Truth or Consequences, The Role of Philosophers in Policymaking that was published in Ethics in 1987. And he reflected on his involvement in the President's um, Commission on the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and other work kind of in the early 1980s. Um, and he concluded that there's a deep, deep conflict between the goals and constraints of public policy processes and the aims of academic scholarly activity in general and a philosophical activity in particular. And so he said this, Truth is the central virtue of scholarly work. Scholars are taught to follow the argument and evidence wherever they lead without regard for the social consequences of doing so. Whether the results are unpopular or in conflict with um, conventional or authoritative views, determining the truth to the best of one's abilities is the goal. In philosophy especially, nothing is to be immune from question and criticism. All assumptions are open to and must withstand critical scrutiny. Now, he does admit that philosophers don't always get it right, um, but he says that's the ideal. So in policymaking, he says there's an altogether different set of goals. In the policy context, the central concern is, and he says, and ought to be, the consequences of their actions for public policy and the persons those policies will affect. So the unconstrained search for the truth, he says, might actually lead to policies that have bad consequences. Um, so Brock says, when philosophers enter the policy domain, they need to adopt a primary concern for the consequences of their policies and not for the pursuit of truth. Um, he doesn't really use the language of advocacy, but I think that's exactly what he's talking about. He's saying in the co policy context, you have to advocate for policies that result in certain kinds of consequences and outcomes and not do something else. So in other words, you have to plead for and support, uh, recommend something um, and not something else, even if that something else actually better aligns with um, uh, the pursuit of, of, a, of truth and of a good argument. So the ideal outcome in, in academic philosophy is getting to the truth or as close to it as possible. And the ideal outcome in policy is something completely different. So if we grant that assumption, which I think is open to question, but if we grant that assumption, then could or should philosophers enter the policy realm as philosophers or must philosophers remove their philosophical crowns and enter as ordinary citizens, albeit as ones who are particularly good at analyzing and crafting arguments. The parallel question for us today is whether for any given healthcare profession, uh, members of that profession may act in the public policy space as members of that profession, um, or are there inherent tensions between the goals of public policy and their professional goals? So in other words, must doctors remove their white coats when entering the public policy space um, to advocate for particular policies? And the question is much more serious for health professionals because as it turns out, people don't usually care what philosophers think um, and we don't have a lot of social sway, but people do care what physicians and nurses think and say. And there's some authority that comes with being recognized as the physician in particular. 
So I think the question is much more serious um, for you all than it is for me. Um, on first blush, I think it looks like a lot of advocacy domains and contexts and some targets of advocacy, such as advocating to meet the individual needs of patients are just obviously um, in line with rather than at odds with the goals of medicine. Um, they're not only compatible with, but they're actually at least sometimes obligatory. Um, but even here, the question of which tactics health professionals might use to advocate are, it's, an, it's an important question. It's one we're gonna come back to. Um, in addition to a more traditional focus on advocating for patients though, a number of professional societies and other bodies today have held that public policy advocacy or public health advocacy is a responsibility of health professionals. Um, and, or they list advocacy among the competencies that professionals must demonstrate. So in the American Board of Internal Medicine and its Charter on Medical Professionals in 2002 called for a commitment to the promotion of public health and preventive medicine, as well as pub public advocacy on the part of each physician. Um, the American Medical Association endorses a similar commitment and says that physicians must advocate for the social, economic, educational, and political changes that ameliorate suffering and con contribute to human well-being. Um, numerous authors have also argued that um, for the importance of, of public policy advocacy for physicians um, as a part, form of medical professionalism. Several specialty societies now include advocacy um, and um, the American of Pediatrics in, in particular has in called for greater physician involvement in advocacy related to childhood um, uh, poverty and community health. Um, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada also has um, held out advocacy as a competency in the training of physicians. Um, and there's a much more support for physician um, public advocacy and public health advocacy than I think there ever used to be. Um, a lot of these people appeal to um, Virchow, the 19th century physician um, who wanted to treat medicine as a social science um, and saw medicine as intimately connected to the social world and to politics. So that name comes up a lot and I imagine it will come up in your discussions this year as well. Um, among nursing organizations and in the nursing scholarly literature, again, there's significant arguments not only for nurses as patient advocates, but as um, in being involved in policy advocacy in various ways. Um, so in short, health professionals don't seem to necessarily um, have the same identity crisis that Brock, uh, Brock thinks that philosophers have um, in terms of engaging in public policy advocacy, because many of your professional societies are saying, hey, this is actually a part of your professional responsibility, but I don't think it's so simple because general calls for advocacy are actually quite complex. They don't tell us very much, and they in fact obscure quite a bit. They don't tell us anything about what kinds of advocacy or when or using what tactics. And so I wanna talk more about that today. Um, there's a common thread among the kinds of advocacy that I've talked about so far, and those that is that they're all sort of related to advancing health in some way, um, which I guess is no surprise if you're talking about health professionals, um, but it's not, again, quite so simply. Um, when is it appropriate for health professionals to speak about things that are maybe not directly related to health um, and yet still be recognized as health professionals? When, when is it appropriate for you to identify yourself as a health professional in the advocacy context? Um, when is it not? Are there advocacy efforts in which physicians might engage, for example, that could harm their relationships with some patients? Um, a colleague shared with me recently um, concerns about holding a public position on wars in Gaza and Israel and Ukraine, um, wondering what it would be, not even just, just to be known as somebody who held a particular set of views. Um, these conflicts can have serious implications, of course. Th these conflicts can have serious health implications, of course. But this physician was, was sharing a concern about being recognized as talking about more than health in these contexts. Um, I was talking earlier with somebody and I said, you know, it's one thing to sort of say, I'm going to advocate for access to polio vaccines in a particular war zone versus I'm going to advocate for public policy writ large regarding this conflict. And so I'd had this conversation recently with a colleague who worried about being identified as such. Um, even decisions about what pins or buttons to wear on a white coat are fraught. Um, and some people might say, well, that's not really rising to the level of advocacy. I think that's a question, you know, is that a form of advocacy or not? Um, but the point is that how professionals align themselves with positions and debates that play out in the policy space can raise questions for them. Um, in thinking about the focus on health-related policy, I think it's really important to note that there are different underlying conceptions of health and disease that could affect how people interpret um, 
and, and interpret what it means to advocate for health. So as it turns out, not everybody sees and understands health in exactly the same way. Um, there are different under ways of understanding evidence, different priorities that people might set. Um, so sharing a commitment to advocacy, even a commitment to advocacy to promote health will not necessarily mean sharing a view about precisely what to support and how to support it. Um, and in cases of conflict between health and non-related, non-health related interests um, of patients or patient populations, we might see even some more interesting challenges. Um, in preparing for this, I found an interesting case study from a while ago that had appeared in what was then Virtual Mentor and is now the AMA Journal of Ethics, um, in which a physician reported um, the following. This was a physician in Allentown, Pennsylvania, who had written to a local newspaper advocating for policies that were aimed at reducing greenhouse gases, um, including installing um, carbon capture technologies on coal-fired plants. So Allentown, Pennsylvania, for those of you who don't know, is a, a region that has historically had a lot of its um, economy in um, coal. One of his patients saw the letter and came to an appointment really angry, really upset, said, you and you people who are advocating for climate change are gonna destroy my family's livelihood and the livelihood of a lot of people around here. Um, and the doctor said, writing that letter really hurt my relationship with this patient. Um, there can be tensions between um, the responsibilities of health professionals when it comes to health-related advocacy and conflicting accounts of how to resolve those tensions. Um, advancing policies that are over all good for pub the public might at times undermine the interests of particular patient populations, right? To advance the interests of the whole might mean we don't do certain things that are actually really good for certain sets of patients. Um, think of some simple examples like restricting antibiotic use, right? It might be really good for this patient to have this condition treated with an antibiotic and get better sooner. Um, but overall, there may be goals of reducing overuse of antibiotics. Um, advocating to expand health um, payment you know, coverage for certain kinds of really expensive um, interventions at the might come at, at, be in tension with aiming to expand basic care and access to basic care for more people. So what's good for people who um, need really expensive interventions is to have you advocate for getting those covered, but at the same time that comes at a price. Um, last week I was a group with a group that was advocating for increased funding for presuming some level of success level of success still to be defined um, for xenotransplantation and arguing that, you know, we treat cancer patients and we spend a lot of money giving cancer patients just a few weeks to months of life, we should be doing the same thing for potential transplant recipients. Um, but another take on that same issue might call for radically reduced spending on all of those items that might be considered sort of high cost, low value in the name of radically expanding basic access to healthcare for many more people. So even advocating for health related goals can involve tensions. And we should recognize that people's different background assessments of what's more important or less important can lead to different conclusions about what to do. Um, so navigating these tensions, I think, requires a lot of transparency about what those background commitments are. Um, so coming back to Brock's reflections on philosophers um, as advocates um, will help us to kind of direct our attention um, to a second set of important issues, um, namely questions about what tactics may be used in advocacy. Um, so there's already one set of tensions around what exactly do you advocate for, health and non-health, even among health, what do you advocate for? And then there's the questions of how you do it. Um, so Brock notes the different goals of academic philosophy and uh, academic scholarship and public policy call in turn for different virtues and behaviors in their practitioners. Um, and it's here that I think Brock really gets at what's bothering him. He's really bothered that as a philosopher, he did what he called playing fast and loose with the truth. Um, so he, and, and sort of, and he described it as becoming manipulative towards others. So he describes his experience of working with these commissioners who were trying to make um, decisions about the appropriateness of withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining interventions. Um, and there was this narrative that it was okay to withhold or to withdraw a life-sustaining intervention because that was allowing the patients to die of their underlying disease versus um, actually causing death and you weren't intentionally killing. And so this was at a time when there were real debates about whether or not you could ever remove a ventilator, right? This was in the aftermath of the Quinlan case. Um, and Brock said he did not believe that there was a morally relevant difference in some of these situations between killing and letting die. And he thought that either both were okay or both were at least morally relevantly similar. And the commissioners had really decided these were very different things. 
Um, and because they were saying they were very different things, they were comfortable saying, yes, it's permissible to withhold and withdraw life-sustaining interventions. No, it's not permissible to kill. So Brock recounts this whole experience he has of trying to decide, like, do I show them why their arguments are flawed or do I just kind of go with it and encourage them and let them go um, down this mistaken path just so that we get to what he believed was the right conclusion? And he did the latter. Um, and so he writes about his discomfort doing that. Um, and, but notes that that's really the duty of the philosopher in the, in the public space. If you're gonna go in there, you better be willing to kind of be a little bit messy and get your hands dirty um, because um, you're gonna have to play fast and loose with the truth and you're gonna have to be manipulative towards others in order to accomplish the right policy goals. So this was this question of tactics. And so then there's the question of tactics for health professionals. Um, are there tactics that might undermine um, the integrity of a health professional as a health professional? Are there tactics that might be used in these different advocacy contexts, public policy, the clinical setting, other contexts um, that might offend professional integrity? Um, and so to answer that question, we need a background understanding of the profession, of professionalism, of professional integrity, of the practices or behaviors that violate such integrity. And I think that's another place where you're going to actually, if you get in, you know, deep into discussion, you're going to find disagreement among health professionals um, about what exactly is required. And I'll, and I'll give you one example of that later. Um, so I thought I'd run through some potential tactics and some of these you might not even think count as advocacy, but we'll see. Um, advocacy might involve simply providing evidence to decision makers um, in the most straightforward way possible, attempting to deliver facts, um, especially those that um, people might not have otherwise known about or had access to, um, explaining those facts in as non-framed a way as possible. Um, it might happen in the context of individual patients, um, truly trying to help somebody just have the information they need and reflect on their values or doing that with um, shared decision maker, uh, surrogate decision makers. It might involve um, sharing information with policymakers or legislators, um, school boards, other kinds of arenas. Um, but in such a, what I mean here is there's just, there's really no intentional withholding of information or framing of information to try to get people to come to any particular conclusion just providing education. Is that advocacy? Because you think, well, at least you should make decisions with this information um, or, or not. Um, it might involve using existing structures to report violations. Oh, I don't know why I did that. Um, or um, uh, to report violations or to report fraud, right? Some people will get into the, the discussion of whistleblowing. Is whistleblowing a form of advocacy? Um, you might actually frame information in a way to encourage specific actions or decisions. Um, here, the goal is to deliver evidence in a way that is meant to shape the decision, to get people to come to one conclusion rather than a different one. Um, and this, I think, is sometimes we might think of the literature on nudging and choice architecture, um, but it might also mean intentionally omitting information or obscuring information. You could do this in a policy setting. You could do this in a clinical setting. Um, using powerful persuasion. Um, we can imagine a whole range of, of ways in which clinicians um, or physicians of other sorts um, might be involved in powerful persuasion. Um, in some contexts, this might involve guilt tripping. I'll share a story. Um, back in 2000, I lived in Houston. I was in graduate school. Um, my husband's aunt had metastatic um, breast cancer and had um, was living with us. And um, she had brain lesions and some of them were causing real problems. She couldn't walk. Um, and so they had said, okay, we can do stereotactic radio surgery. Um, the standard of care is to follow that by whole brain radiation. And she had already done all of her research. And she said she wanted to do the stereotactic radio surgery because that was going to relieve this, hopefully relieve the symptoms that were leaving her with significant, um, uh, difficulty walking. But she had accepted that the, the, the next step was really to focus on hospice care. So she wanted some symptom relief, but she was not trying to do whole brain radiation because she knew that this was not going to cure her. She said, whether or not I do it, I'm gonna die within six to nine months. And she was very realistic about that. And um, so she had declined the whole brain radiation. And I was sitting with her as she had this giant, you know, things screwed to her head to undergo stereotactic radio surgery when a physician walked in to try to enroll her in a clinical trial that was randomizing people to stereotactic radio surgery plus whole brain radiation for two weeks, standard of care, or stereotactic radio surgery and no whole brain radiation, which was actually the care path she had chosen. Um, and she declined because she did not want to be randomized to whole brain radiation. This was a decision she had come to very deliberately. And this physician kept pressuring her and, and saying more and more. And at one point he said, you owe it 
to the women who came before you. You are alive today because other people participated in research. You owe it to other women and to future women to participate in research. And I was like, whoa, well, that was bold. Um, and I was a graduate student doing research ethics. So this was all kinds of fascinating for me, right? Um, let's just say it didn't work. Um, she did not relent. Um, I was there to back her up. But it was an interesting example. And he, he was advocating, in a sense, maybe in his mind, for the importance of research, right? And the importance of, of, and, you know, of transforming medicine in the future depends on that. Um, there's other tactics that people might use in other contexts. Um, so one of the things I'm very interested in is organ transplantation and organ procurement. Um, and there are some organ, organ, OPO, organ procurement organization requesters who have reported all kinds of tactics that they use um, to sort of try to build a rapport with family, to use particular language, to bring food, to make people comfortable, to kind of suss out the family dynamics and figure out who do I need to get to agree to this um, and to win people over in, sorts of, in, in, in some kind of way. And they will sometimes describe this as a form of advocating for organ transplantation, right? Advocating for potential recipients. Um, so that's another example of a place where people might use various kinds of tactics to try to get people to come to particular conclusions. Um, and then of course, there's all kinds of other persuasion that goes on in the clinical setting that I think people often recognize as just part of good patient care, right? Like I will be forever grateful for the nurse who talked my father-in-law into not going home after his hip replacement and accepting two weeks of inpatient rehab as opposed to doing his physical therapy at home, it was not gonna get him up and about and moving um, effectively. He initially declined that and some wonderful nurse sort of said, hmm, let's talk about that some more, right? Thank you. Um, I keep doing this. Um, giving you previews, sorry. Um, shaping the medical curriculum um, to address specific topics and positions as some have done recently on issues of race and gender and disability. Is that a form of advocacy? Um, Exaggerating a situation um, to, um, or avoiding nuance, right? To lead to particular conclusions. This happens, for example, in crafting public messaging on all kinds of topics. I think a lot of people might look to the early days of um, discussions about mask use and mask non-use in the pandemic and say, wow, there was a whole lot of not nuanced discussion going on there, right? Giving very st strong statements in various directions um, and exaggerating things at times to get people to behave certain sorts of ways, um, in ways that by the, of course, in the end might have backfired. Um, ac accessing operating room time, right? Securing access to OR time um, might involve exaggerating the urgency of a case. Um, when I have brought this up with some of my surgeon friends, they had a lot to say. Um, Telling lies or deceiving others by withholding or misrepresenting information. There's been a great deal written about this, particularly in the context of lying to or deceiving third party payers to get coverage for treatment um, and in terms of gaming the organ allocation system um, in an attempt to help patients gain priority. Um, what about refusing to travel um, to particular locations or hold conferences in specific places um, as some individuals and groups have either done or suggested um, in the last couple of years over things like gender bathroom bills and abortion. Going on strike or engaging other forms of collective action um, as, or, such as work slowdowns. Um, often these are aimed at advancing um, the interests or welfare of workers um, and not necessarily of patients, but those interests are often intertwined. Um, and this is a place where I think the literature has shifted a bit in healthcare. There used to be these, like very hard lines, like absolutely no, you should never do this. Um, and as I read sort of newer literature, there, there seemed to be some people saying that under some circumstances, this might be acceptable. Um, what about engaging in civil disobedience, as some have said they will um, or should do um, with res respect to providing abortion access, for example, um, or with respect to providing or not providing um, uh, access to physician-assisted suicide, or what about supporting people who are um, being drafted into military service and are trying to um, avoid participation in what they think are unjust wars? Um, so that list is incomplete. Um, and I think hopefully you will flesh it out some more. Um, I think that it probably includes some tactics that some people would say violate the norms of healthcare professionals, at least under some circumstances. Um, there's The literature is pretty mixed um, actually on the whole question of lying to get um, patients coverage. A lot of people um, have mixed views about that um, as well as mixed views about strikes. Um, and there's been a bit of, of um, of context, uh, of, excuse me, of, um, of discussions, particularly on um, on the issue of strikes, I was saying somebody earlier, I had read these 
just kind of the fun things that happens when you look at statistics. Um, if you look at the data on patient mortality, when physicians or other healthcare workers go on strike, um, deaths go down in hospitals, right? That makes a lot of sense. You're not doing a lot of elective procedures, but um, somebody might say like, oh, look, you can save lives by going on strike. Um, so we have to be really careful um, in how we assess these kinds of things. And there's been a lot of discussion in the literature and a lot of empirical research on people's attitudes towards strikes and towards um, uh, lying to, to third party payers. Um, and I think often the downstream consequences of these tactics are not well thought out and well considered. So I think it's worth um, um, thinking about that. Um, some people remind us, hey, truthfulness has not always been a part of medicine, but often I think today people say that just bold faced lying is often gonna be a violation of the integrity of a health professional um, or some of these other tactics might be, might be problematic at least sometimes. So if we take all of that and we take the earlier observation that there can be tension among healthcare professionals' advocacy obligations, um, we find ourselves with another question. Um, when there are tensions among the ends or goals of a profession, for example, um, between the good of a patient and what's good for the public overall, or when the tactics that are necessary to achieve advocacy goals um, might violate professional norms, um, when may prof health professionals engage in advocacy using those tactics? Are there times where they ought not to engage in advocacy in a particular way? Are there hard no's? Um, and when I started thinking about that, one of the questions or the topics that came to mind was I was reminded of the 2010 statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Bioethics, um, in which they had um, made a public statement that said that sometimes a ritual nick um, to prevent girls from being taken um, to places to undergo female genital cutting might be appropriate. Um, they also said it was a possible way of getting families that currently had their children completely outside of the healthcare system to build rapport, get them into the system and protect these girls from more serious harm. The statement was met with fierce opposition um, from a lot of people saying, I don't care how beneficial you think that might be, we should have absolutely no role in ever staying anything that even seems to support female genital um, cutting. And so they said this was a hard no. It didn't matter what potential benefits there were or what goals you were trying to achieve and how noble those goals were, this was something that should not be done. And the American Academy of Pediatrics did withdraw that statement later that year. Um, we might also ask about tactics um, and are there tactics that should never be used? Um, I've mentioned um, gaming, the sort of gaming the system to um, uh, secure um, organ um, priority for a recipient. Um, and that's been the subject of discussion over a number of years in a lot of different contexts. Um, there was a big NPR story about it a while ago. Um, it's, it's a topic that um, the organ procurement system has addressed a number of times. Um, there have been a lot of examples of gaming tactics at one point um, for heart transplant recipients, things like putting patients on medications that automatically made them status one, um, implanting devices that they didn't necessarily need, admitting them to the ICU, um, all to make it look like they were, you know, to bump them up um, in terms of prioritizing them. Um, because the allocation criteria assumed the patients on these medications in these in the ICU and with these devices obviously were, were more urgent, were sicker patients. Um, in 1999, this has been going on for a while, UNOS implemented some listing procedures that um, attempted to change that, but and they've implemented more recent changes in, two, in 2018 because it turns out that you all are smart. And so you give are given a system and you say, how can I, what can I do better? And so you figure it out. And so now they've changed the system again. And some research coming largely out of University of Chicago um, that was just published last year suggests that it's possible that people are finding some ways around even the new um, criteria. So manipulation of weightless priority has been really heavily debated. Um, it's often called gaming, um, but I did find some authors who really wanted to challenge that language of gaming. They said, that's awfully pejorative. Um, you've, you have use that language of gaming like, implying that it's wrong. Um, so one way of asking the question is how might physicians game the system? But another way to ask the question is what will physicians do in order to provide better outcomes for their patients? The latter sounds much more noble, doesn't it? Um, and so they challenge the view that you know you, you can even make these assumptions about what tactics are and are not um, acceptable. So finally, a fourth question is, insofar as advocacy is a professional obligation of some sort at some time, um, are there times when physicians really ought to advocate? Um, and it's not just permissible for them to do so, but obligatory. And is, you know, how does this translate for individual patients? How does it translate to populations? How does it translate to the, popul to the public at large? Um, I think an important question here that I haven't said anything about yet is what risks health professionals might be expected to take um, in order to, uh, to advocate. Um, so there are advocacy opportunities that could expose people to economic loss, to loss of employment, 
um, I think we saw some of that with the pandemic, um, to the wrath of their colleagues. Um, and if you think grownups don't send hate mail, they do, um, to physical harm, right? I think of contexts in which um, health professionals have exposed themselves to risk of physical harm um, in order to, to provide care or to, or to simply to advocate in other kinds of ways. Um, so all of these are things that are, we need to talk about in the context of talking about advocacy. And I think the professional statements, society statements are often very thin on this kind of stuff. So it's one of the reasons I said, you know, general statements about advocacy are not terribly helpful. Um, this is also a good place to remind ourselves that background moral positions may lead to very different answers to these questions, not only about whether to engage in advocacy, but provide precisely what to advocate for. Um, I think often people will think when they talk about public policy advocacy and public health advocacy, they have particular goals in mind. They have, they have we're gonna advocate for these particular views and positions. And I think we need to recognize that not everybody shares those. Um, even among healthcare professionals, those are not always gonna be shared. Um, last week, I've witnessed a very strong, um, by, um, let's say um, animated uh, interaction between a group of health professionals who were trying to argue for increased access to living kidney um, donation and living kidney donor transplantation and arguing that maybe it was time to really seriously consider certain kinds of economic incentives um, and others who were arguing that no matter what, how, no, it doesn't matter if you're going to increase access to organ transplantation, we should never either commodify organs or um, be at risk of um, that anybody would donate for anything other than altruistic reasons. Um, I could say a lot about what I think about so-called altruistic donation, but I'll wait for that. Um, so the underlying debate here was two very different ways, views about how to, what goals were more important to achieve and what tactics you could use in order to achieve those goals. Um, and it became very clear they were never going to see eye to eye. Um, but making decisions about what one, one ought to do or may do in the face of tensions among rules, obligations, and principles or, um, or goals is really familiar um, in the world of, of healthcare ethics. Um, there's lots of debate about the theoretical language to use, et cetera, but it's, it's what people do, right? We're often balancing things um, and talking about these kinds of challenges. So um, lots of frameworks have been proposed. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some questions that I think are helpful um, to navigating those kinds of decisions and tensions. Um, so what I want to do in the next couple of minutes is propose a series of questions and possibly a framework for analyzing questions around um, health professionals and making advocacy decisions. Um, so I see that there really are four overarching questions and issues. First, um, is there an inherent conflict between the goals of the or, or, or primary purpose of the profession um, and the advocacy that's being considered? So to answer this, we're going to need an account of the primary purposes of the profession, right? And telling me, well, these two twin goals, well, what about when they, they compete, right? What do we do about all of that? Um, so that's the first question. Um, we need an account of the primary purpose of medicine. And even if we assume it's related to health, we have to realize that there are gonna be background discussions and differences about what it means to, um, to promote health um, and well-being. Second question is what tactics may or ought to be used um, when uh, and which ones should not be used um, in advocacy. A third question, see, question is whether advocacy that's using tactics that might violate professional norms or undermine the interests of, the, of some um, parties might ever be permissible. Um, and when then, when is there an obligation, and if so, when, to engage in advocacy? Um, so what I want to do is go through a series of um, a kind of framework, decision-making framework that I think can help us kind of think through um, these questions. I don't think there's anything magic about what I'm going to say. There's all different kinds of ways of asking ourselves questions. Um, these will hopefully elicit some some thoughts um, from you and some further comment and discussion on on what how we might think about advocacy. Um, for each of these, I think again we need to recognize that there are different background moral considerations, different worldviews, different understandings of um, what level of risk people are willing to tolerate, what kinds of risks people are willing to tolerate, what counts as health, what um, how we should respond to uncertainty what is right, what is good, all of that, all of those factors are gonna play a role in how people answer these questions. Um, the coal example earlier, the coal mining town example earlier shows that people can have really different rankings of goods and values. So even, you know, we, we are here, we're in a health institution, health medical school, you think promoting health, but it turns out there are things other than health that people care about. Um, and so they may rank those really differently. Um, and they may value those really differently. Um, and different aspects of health might be valued really differently. Um, and so that cold, you know, town example earlier shows that, right? This person says, yeah, health, great, but what about our livelihood? Um, so 
questions to ask before we even get into further details. I think the first question is, is the advocacy that I'm considering compatible with the goals of my health profession? Roughly speaking, um, with advancing the health of individuals or populations or the public at large. Um, again, lots of background questions that are going to matter here, but I think that's a question that people need to consider. Am I going to be, as a health professional, engaged in advocacy in around something that actually is compatible with a health profession? And the next two questions, I will call them honesty checks. Um, the first is, do I have the expertise regarding this health-related matter to speak authoritatively as a physician, a nurse, or whatever other health professional you might be? I think things get much more complicated when we start to think about advocacy um, for policies and practices that are not directly related to health. They might be downstream somehow connected to health because lots of things might affect our health and well-being overall. Um, but do I have the expertise to be speaking about something? So these are questions that I think health professionals should be asking. That's why I'm using the language of I. I'm a philosopher only, not a health professional. But I'm using the language of I because I want to sort of help you think about what questions might you ask yourself and how. Um, do I have the expertise about this health-related matter? One. And if it's a matter that's not directly related to health, do I have the expertise? And certainly, do I have the expertise as a health professional to be speaking. So should I be presenting myself as a health professional in this space? Um, a health professional who enjoys status, trust, authority, um, and, and power um, in many cases. Um, for example, um, you know, if effective advocacy requires physicians to, ad to determine whether they have expertise on a particular topic or a nurse to have an expertise on a particular topic, they have to ask themselves, do I know something because I'm a doctor that any other member of the general public wouldn't have or wouldn't know or couldn't know? Um, so with respect to climate change, here, take an example of climate change, right? People might, in, in health professionals might be able to talk about specific things that, um, that are harmful to health, right? But whether health professionals are have the expertise to say, how exactly you should address climate change, what policies and what practices need to be implemented to, um, to address climate change strikes me as a very far-fetched claim, right? There may be health professionals who develop that expertise, but I'm pretty sure there's nothing in medical school or nursing school or anything else that teaches you all about different technologies for um, addressing climate change, right? And so when people go out and speak as physicians, as nurses on these matters, um, I think they need to be um, sort of checking um, their expertise and wondering whether, asking themselves whether they have the expertise to be speaking as health professionals. Third, am I really advocating for patients and populations or public health, or am I using this as an excuse to advance other interests of my own? Um, so then I've got this set of questions that are really adapted from um, something that my friend and colleague Jim Dubois developed. Um, he's at WashU in their Bioethics Research Center. Um, a series of questions that I think can be helpful to ask ourselves anytime we're making sort of a, trying to look at a topic that looks complicated or looks really simple, but might not be. Um, so in contemplating advocacy, why is why am I even asking this as, as an ethical question? Like, is this an ethical question? What's the ethical issue at stake? Um, why is this an ethically relevant question? Second, who are the stakeholders, right? Like who stands to be affected by what I do or don't do, right? My, my engagement in this advocacy or my non-engagement, who's affected, who might be harmed? Um, then what facts are relevant to my decisions? And this includes what do I not know, right? I mean, we have to be honest with ourselves sometimes. We don't always know all of the things there are to know. Um, some other people might know those things and sometimes there's simply are things that are unknown. But acknowledging that I think is really important. Um, when we fail to acknowledge that, we get into situations in which something that Professor Zolov has written a lot about and hype. Um, I think back to stem cell um, research days and hype of sort of going all in like this is so, this is everything, right? And instead of acknowledging, there's a lot that we don't know yet, right? And I'm, I'm seeing that now in other kinds of areas. Um, then what are the ethically relevant principles, norms, and values? Like, is there conflict? Is there tension among them? Um, what's at stake here? What's going on? Um, are there different rankings? Are there the, of these values and these norms that I need to be aware of, that I need to be taking account of? Do I have to be honest about how I am ranking them and how I am seeing them? Um, what options do I have? So I think people often see things in the world of twos, like I can either do this or I don't do this, um, right? What, what is the full range of options in, before me as I think about um, an advocacy kind of decision? Um, and what decision do I think I should make and why? And is it justified? Um, and so at that point, I think we have to ask ourselves some questions like, is this actually going to be effective and actually do something? So 
there's lots of times where I think people engage in various forms of advocacy to make themselves feel good, maybe. Like they feel like I did something, right? But one question I think we have to ask ourselves is, did we, right? Is it gonna be effective? If it's not gonna be effective, are the harms that come from engaging this, including the opportunity costs, um, worthwhile? Or if not, maybe it's not justifiable to engage in this. Um, is it necessary? So if I'm gonna do something that involves overriding some important professional norm or involves harming somebody or involves putting somebody else at risk, like, is it, do I have to? Is it necessary in order to achieve the goal? It might be, but I think asking ourselves whether or not something is necessary um, is really important. Um, am I doing it in the least problematic way? So if I'm undermining the interests of some stakeholders or, or harming someone in this process, have I minimized that harm? Um, is there something more that I could do to minimize the harm? Um, will the probable benefits outweigh um, any of these sort of harms or infringed upon norms that I might be, um, might be preparing to, to undertake? Um, is what I wanna support sufficiently important to justify all of these other problematic um, outcomes? Am I being impartial, right? Um, and finally, could I be transparent? If I had to publicly justify this, if I had to say something, if I had to be called to account, like could I, could I justify how I came to my decision and why, whether it was to advocate or to not advocate, could I, could I explain myself and defend myself? Um, so those are developed from um, intentionally from a public health kind of ethics framework that was developed by Childress and a whole bunch of other people. Um, but I think they're just questions that that we should ask ourselves in a lot of different contexts. Um, what am I about to do and do I really have to do it? Is it important enough? Is it gonna work? Because many times I've been in a position where people have wanted me to, I was president of ASBH for a time and people want the society to make a statement on something. And the society has rules against making all these statements, but nevertheless, this would come up periodically. And I often found myself thinking, we could invest so much time and energy and resources into this. And you know what? No one cares what we say. <laughs> um, so one thing that I've not talked about, um, but that I'm curious to know whether it's happening here as it is in some places, is how to account for advocacy in evaluating um, faculty, academic faculty. Um, this has become an issue in my part of the academic world. I know it's an issue in some parts of the medical um, academic world um, where faculty are saying, look, advocacy is important and I want credit. Um, I want kind of credit towards tenure and promotion and you know gold stars um, for engaging in advocacy work. And then the question becomes how? What kind of credit does that look for look like? Um, where where do you get credit? So some people have said my advocacy work should count as part of my research and scholarship. Some people have said, no, we need another category, another way to evaluate faculty. There now needs to be a separate column for advocacy. Um, and of course, I'm constantly saying, oh, really? And what kind of advocacy is going to count? Because I think when people are doing this, again, they're often assuming that people are going to advocate for specific kinds of positions and not maybe ones that they disagree with. Um, so there's been a lot, lot discussed about this, and I think not much um, um, clarity at all about how to evaluate advocacy, whether or not you should even evaluate advocacy as you evaluate faculty for um, for tenure and promotion. Um, but it's something that has has come up in some contexts and may come up in your context as well. Um, so I imagine that you will have all kinds of interesting things to say because you're thinking spending a year thinking about this topic. Um, and I think that's um, a really neat opportunity. Um, so I'd love to hear from you, your examples, your thoughts, um, your comments, um, including your comments on sort of what, what exactly is advocacy? What counts, right? So I threw out a whole bunch of different things that might count as advocacy. And you might say, well, that one's not really advocacy, that's something else. So how do we think about the boundaries of what counts as advocacy and what doesn't? And does it matter? Like, what rides on that? So I'm gonna leave with that question and um, open it up to all of you for um, discussion.